Gitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy. Welcome back to our coverage of Bitcoin 2023 here in Miami. I'm Michelle McCory. My next guest says that Bitcoin price is not going up. All prices are going down relative to Bitcoin. Jeff Booth is a general partner at Ego Death Capital. He is a prolific writer and author of The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is Key to an Abundant Future. Jeff, very good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, great to be here, Michelle. Great to have you with us, Jeff. A lot to discuss and certainly want to get into that opening statement that I made, quoting you, that the price of Bitcoin is not going up, that everything is going down relative to Bitcoin. But you have so many nuggets of wisdom and concepts that are so enlightening that I want to try and introduce the Kitco viewers to some of those first. And perhaps a good place to start is with your theory on deflation. You say that technology leads to deflation and that deflation is something that we should be embracing and we need to be looking at inflation and the current system very, very differently. Now, we typically have a lot of conversations here on Kitco focusing on inflation. And you're saying that that conventional thinking of it is all wrong. And that Now, the conventional thinking is, of course, that the Fed targets a certain inflation rate in order to stave off deflation in the event of an economic downturn. But you said that we don't actually need inflation, that it only seems true because of the rules of the game that have been designed that way intentionally, and that we should be trying to embrace deflation because it can be fantastic, as you say, and could bring about tremendous abundance. So that's a very big concept. Why don't we start with you breaking that down for us? <laughs> <laughs> big concept. And, and, and I think the first thing people need to realize, and when they're listening to this for the first time, this is going to be hard to digest, or it might be hard to digest. And that's because you're measuring a system problem from the system creating the problem. And all of the politics on top, no matter what side, is just theater on top of a system problem. And here's a system problem. Globally, there's about $400 trillion of debt. If you tried to pay back that debt at $1 a second, if, uh, if you tried to pay back $1 trillion at $1 a second, it would take you approximately 32,000 years to pay back debt at $1 a second. And, and so the debt is already insolvent, but we pretend it's solvent because we allow governments to manipulate money to pay back the debt in cheaper dollars tomorrow. And that manipulation of money carries a whole huge, huge uh, uh, problem throughout society because it's just ma manipulation. And so what's actually happening is if you just, economics is way easier than people think, way easier. We've been, we've been believe that nobody can understand economics because of all of the complexity and the more and more complexity and whether we just tune out and we live in that world, okay, we have to trust those other people because they know what's happening. And I'm going to simplify it really simple for your audience. Prices fall to the marginal cost of production. In Economics 101, everybody knows that. It's why your calculator app on your phone is free. It's why your photos on your phone are free. So as product productivity increases. Let's break down okay. marginal price of production yeah. for, for our viewers. Why don't we just start off with that while we're explaining the concept? So, so in, in that case, in, in, in prices falling to the marginal cost of production, what it means is entrepreneurs are creating value for society. And, and let's say your calculator used to be a physical product mm -hmm. and then it turned into a digital product. Mm -hmm. And as it, the calculator turned into a digital, digital part, product, the first calculator app on the phone cost money. And then the next entrepreneur came in and said, I'm gonna offer a better calculator app for cheaper. And then the next one, and another one for cheaper, and another one for cheaper. And that continues to fall until it's zero. And yeah. then, then the entrepreneurs, well, there's a penny of profit in it, there is entrepreneurs all over the world which will attack that profit until it goes to zero and then it uh, and, and then it goes to zero and those entrepreneurs move to a different industry and, and we benefit from the calculator that costs us zero and comes automatically with our phones now. Ex exactly and that uh, that calculator is no longer in GDP mm. it's free that productivity so you can't measure it in GDP the productivity went to free Okay. And so now there's less things to count in GDP. 
cut. Now that happens on your uh, that happens on your photos. We used to pay for a whole bunch of uh, photos, and and we used to take less photos as a result. Now we take unlimited photos, and they're all free. Right. And that happens on your Zoom calls, and that happens on all of these things, and it's happening at a faster and faster rate. So if you just it, and, and by the way, you could slow it down. You could say, I'm going to regulate an industry to slow down the prices falling to the marginal cost of production. Um, but what ends up happening is then that regulated industry gets tacked from somewhere else in the world that takes the advantage. And then and eventually prices fall to marginal costs of production. So over a long enough time horizon, prices always fall to the marginal cost of production. And that is and, and you could ask that in econom, economist what I just said, and they would say, yes, that's true. So, tick. Everybody knows that. We know, we can see it all around us, that we have exponentially increasing productivity. Artificial intelligence is coming, and if you think artificial intelligence is something today, if you wait a year or two or three, artificial intelligence is going to merge with machines, and it's going to bring productivity gains that we can't even imagine right now. And it's going, and mean, meaning that the prices will fall faster and faster and faster. And when I say fall, they should fall faster and faster and faster. And so, tick. So one, prices fall the marginal cost of production. Two, that marginal cost of production is falling exponentially all around the world. Um, and three, the only thing that could measure that is a system with, with, without manipulation, where the denominator can't move. So what's happening with Bitcoin's 21 million cap that's outside of the existing counterparty system, outside of the $400 trillion of debt that is unrepayable already, is it's repricing that entire debt stack, whether it's through inflation or deflation. And it's just moving and it's measuring all prices relative to Bitcoin coming down forever. It's measuring economic law. That's what's happening. Okay, so... The current system is manipulated, as you say, by central banks and governments, and therefore it's not an accurate way to measure it. But how does that shift happen that the economy resets and gets measured by Bitcoin? So if you, I remember this conversation in, uh, so I, I invested in and built companies in the, in, in, in the early internet. And I remember in 1998, the conversation between big box stores, Sears, and, and, uh, and, and, and the population on both sides of this in Amazon. And, and both were measuring the world. And, and inside that argument, there were a whole bunch of people that would be as radical as they are on Bitcoin or, or why the existing system must live like it does today. It's exactly the same. And one of the arguments was, if Amazon keeps growing like this, then where will I buy my groceries? Because every big box will close. Mm -hmm. And so it was almost fear of a light switch moment and everything's going to collapse. And then on the other side of that argument was no one will ever shop at Amazon. So two polar opposite arguments. Yeah. Do you see the corollary yeah, yeah, yeah. today? I, I remember. I'm old enough to exactly. remember those conversations. And the corollary to what people are talking about Bitcoin yeah. today yeah. and corollary to how they're talking about the existing system today. It's now. Bitcoin is a way bigger phase transition, but the same argument exists right now inside the system because they're measuring the new system from the system. Um, so they're, they're, all of the fear and risk and everything else is they can't imagine a future that looks different. And so, so if you were an executive at Amazon from 1995 to 2010 versus an executive at, Am uh, at Sears, you saw two different worlds. You saw one getting easier and easier and easier and more essentially Amazon was providing more value to people and people were using it. It was getting stronger and stronger and stronger and Sears was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And the, the, your view of the world would be determined by what view, what system you were looking through. Same world. It was just the, the measure you were using to measure the world. And when Sears closed, did anybody care? Well, people at Sears did for sure, <laughs> but, but there were less and less of them over time. Right, as more and more people uh, moved there, moved over, and that's what's happening right now. There is an open monetary network that any person on the planet can move over to, and and essentially measure differently, and not have to pay for four hundred trillion dollars of insolvent debt that's already insolvent, and not having their wages uh, uh, decline in real terms every year, and and 
more and more pe people are moving over to it. And once they measure the world from that new system, they see truth, hope, abundance. But it's really complicated because most people are measuring Bitcoin price from the system that's manipulating. So they think Bitcoin price is going up and down um, and, 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 and they were saying Bitcoin price is going up. It's the opposite. All right, so I get that it's a complete paradigm shift in how you look at the world, but just going back to that Amazon example, yep. and I get that you're saying at first it seems like it's the change that's never going to happen, and then it gradually happens, and then you forget that you even saw the world in a different way. Sure. But on the Amazon example, we still have the, maybe not Sears per se, but the equivalent of Sears. We still have the physical stores that we go to. So how do those systems coexist if we extend that parallel to Bitcoin and the traditional monetary system? So, uh, so it, when we you- We haven't obliterated the, the, the other part is what yeah, I'm saying. So it won't, be, so if you, if you look around the world, um, we think about the, the inflation rate in the U.S. right now because it, it, it's higher than it's been for a long time. And infl inflation is just really theft. I've manipulated money. I've stole, I, there's no vote for it. I've manipulated money to be able to steal money from, uh, from, from people. And, and we, we consider that okay. And so that's happening at a greater and greater rate. And in the, in the U.S., it's starting to become political. But if you look at other nations around the world, in Argentina right now, I think there's 114% inflation rate, Venezuela, 100% inflation rate. And what you'd ask is, why don't those people just move over to Bitcoin? Why aren't they 100% Bitcoiners in Argentina and Venezuela? Why, are, why do 95% stay in the system? Well, we are seeing increased adoption, particularly we, from those countries, especially so far year to date. We do, massive increased adoption, but why isn't it 100%? A function of time, a function of it's, lack of so knowledge. So this is this is why that's important, and it's why important. If your thinking is going to change, all of a sudden the world's just going to be a light switch that changes. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen over a long time horizon. What happens is most people in that system, while it's getting worse and worse, think there's somebody that can save them from that system, a new political leader or something else, yeah. and they vote for more of it, or they march on the streets, and they and they rip down buildings, and they break windows, and then they go home, and all those windows are magically fixed by more printing of money that picks up a picker, picks up a pocket. So most people stay in the system while it's burning, mm -hmm. and they think it's uh, they think it's safe. They give it more strength instead of just walking across. Um, and And by the way, that matters a lot because if they do it all over the world, then most of your listeners will probably do the same thing. Well, people are resistant to change for right. the most part. It's right. a human nature thing that even if you see the situation around you deteriorating, the idea of making a dramatic change is sometimes more problematic because our brain is wired to accept a familiar scenario, even if it's a painful scenario. Right. So I get the point that it doesn't happen immediately, but at some point the discomfort gets so much that the shift will happen. But going back to the point, um, I'm going to stay with the Amazon Sears okay. example because I thought it was a pretty good metaphor there. And you said, well, Sears didn't really do anything about it, right? What could they do? I don't see the global monetary authorities not doing anything about it. Just because like Sears didn't really push back do you not expect there to be more of a pushback if it does become such a threat to the system? 100%. It, 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 you, you have a monetary system that is, that is 10,000 times bigger um, than Bitcoin today and that relies on theft. And at theft, if you just looked at a mere reflection of the world, if you had theft in, in, in essentially if the emergent complex behavior of society was built on theft, then who would win? and who would lose. Probably the, the biggest cheaters would win, and the be, best people at, at deceiving you would win, and the people that were speaking truth would lose. But that system is so prevalent in everything we do when we're measuring the system from that system, and we keep electing those same people to do it more and more and more, thinking that there's a solve from the system. And so you'd have to expect that Bitcoin would have to withstand everything. If a system was that much more powerful, could. Uh, would try everything in its power to break Bitcoin. And every year, Bitcoin gets more decentralized and secure. And more and more, every single year, more decentralized and secure as it spreads out around the world, as more people 
move over to it. And it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It is literally impossible to break. So will, could they, could, even if you could imagine every nation around the world said, we're going to close all on ramps to Bitcoin. Okay. What would happen? Mining would still take place because you're, you're chasing energy and you're going to pay. And a, and, a, and a black market would emerge just like back black markets emerge everywhere else. Um, and, and you'd have an underground economy that would be exploding. Bitcoin would probably grow faster. A peer-to-peer -peer market would explode until other governments said, we need this market because, because it's more, a more efficient network. And what we have to remember is all monopolies do the same, the same thing. Monopoly favors the people closest to the monopoly. So the monopoly today of money favors the people that are the, the wealthiest. Mm -hmm. All of the media that you read is, is all favored by the money monopoly today. And so most of the stuff you read that fa is favored by the monopoly money would do everything possible to dismiss this new network. But it's unstoppable. It is literally unstoppable from a, um, and, and so I've done a lot of work trying to disprove what I'm saying, trying to, where could, where could he, ha what would happen? And I've assigned my probabilities. I used to have a probability of maybe 5% that Bitcoin would break, something would break it. And as I've done all this work, I've realized it's probably a 0.1% probability that it could be broken. And I can't even imagine what that probability, what that would look like. I've done all sorts of scenarios. And so as I've realized that, I've re this is the system based on truth. And I'm gonna just shift all of my time into building to the emergent system that's based on ba based on truth. And as I spent more of my time there, you see all people, there's Bitcoiners everywhere in the world. And within organizations that you would think there's no Bitcoiners, they're the most brilliant people um, inside these organizations. Some of them don't say it publicly because they can't say it publicly. But there are, it, this is growing at a rate that's in, it's literally unstoppable. I recall that when you wrote the book, I believe when you wrote the book, you had a small section dedicated to Bitcoin. One paragraph. One paragraph. And like you've said, subsequent, that like you didn't even imagine Bitcoin was the answer necessarily at the time when you were breaking down your deflation thesis. And as you learned more and more about Bitcoin, you actually realized that there was the answer to this system that's uh, corrupt with with inflation and manipulation of, of monetary policy. So what was that epiphany moment for you? It's what I just said. So I, I had held Bitcoin prior to writing the book, but very, almost as a test, just, okay, what could the, and I, and I looked at a lot of different things. What, so I looked through at a first principles level, all different things. And that's why actually I called in the book kind of a question and a conversation. I know this is true. Technology is exploding, and it's going to be more. Uh, it, it's going to move faster and faster and faster. When I say faster, if you measure on a log scale, AI or Moore's law, it's exactly the same on a log scale. So people are. What's happening is people are watching a frame of a movie instead of the entire movie. So you could predict exactly where AI would be right now if you measured it exponentially. You could predict where it's going next, and that that has been the same for 50 years, a straight line on a log scale. So you, so, so you could know, but you, but you knew most people would be stuck watching a frame of a movie and so scared of the implications because deflation outside of a credit-based system, the system collapses. So the governments can't allow deflation from the credit-based system, no matter what they do. No matter what, you'll hear on CNBC, you'll hear on all these news channels, you'll listen to this news over and over and over again. And that Powell has a choice and this is going to happen. And we'll hear talking heads talk about it over and over and over again. But at the end of the day, they cannot let the productivity of technology flow to you in the form of lower prices from the existing system because the debt resets. And if the debt resets, all of that debt with all the counterparty risk around the world, if it resets like that, that would be a bad day because that bad day would mean you'd go to the store and the supply chain feeling at the store would the store would be closed the banks would be closed there'd be nothing you'd be bar, you'd have you'd move back to a barter based economy the only thing that would be worth value is probably gold and bitcoin and bitcoin would be more valuable because you could trade it in everywhere if if the powers that be allowed deflation to take its natural course of events 
counterparty risk across the entire system, that, that all of that $400 trillion of debt just keeps becoming insolvent. What people Why? think their house is worth. Because, because the money, for, so, so where is the money from the calculator app to pay for GDP or okay. the debt? Fact. Where is the money from their photos to pay for GDP? As prices fall, the debt becomes more expensive in real terms. And, and so you cannot let that happen. So what they're, what they're forced to do is const, essentially on the exact same tangent as, as prices are supposed to be falling and freeing your time. So you, don't, you work less and less each year and get more and more. They have to work exactly the opposite paradigm and exponentially increase monetary printing to steal that time away from you and transfer it up in, uh, in, into higher and higher levels. That's why government is getting bigger. That's why the rich are getting richer. That is why, and there is no choice because because if the if you let that happen, so as as jobs go away, and people have to move onto the street because they don't have a job, and you forced all the housing prices higher and the rents higher, and the government has to come in and print more money to pay those people. Essentially, you're creating modern day slavery out of the system, and there is no way to stop it from the system. There has to be a parallel system. So, a technology ostensibly should allow us to have more time and more freedom because it improves our lives and makes productivity better. But we have inflation and money printing that counters it in order to keep us enslaved in the system. Right. So when we talk about AI, because you touched on that, it takes away, obviously, a certain amount of jobs. What happens to the people that used to have those jobs. So, and this is, this is going to be really... Be AI or automation. Yeah, or yeah but let's use, let's use AI as an example. Um, because today, what's going to happen, because prices fall the marginal cost of production, you can already see um, chat GPT-4 charges $20 uh, a month. And so some people go and pay $20 a month. And then the free source comes out, chat GPT for all. If people want to download that, they can download the entire database of all knowledge to their computer so they don't need the internet. So they could do that for now for free. And a whole bunch of other things come in. And so it gets cheaper and cheaper and better and better. All of these things happen. And as it gets better and better, effectively what we're doing by using it is training the machine to get better and better, to be able to remove more labor. Now the first people that use it, they create more value. And if you imagined, okay, there was $100 of, uh, of value. And then somebody comes in and says, well, I can do this and I can create way more value for your business. And it goes from 100 to 60, but that business wins most of the 60 because a bunch of business, other businesses don't and they fail. Then we'll use the business that gives us more value. So there's an incentive that we race to the things that are giving us more value. And so that person or that business that's going first in AI wins. And then the next piece goes for 40 and then 20 and it keeps running. And so if you if you manipulate money at that rate to make every price go up as jobs fall out of the market, then what you're doing is you're, all of those jobs, all of the people, they're scared, they're anxious, they're going, what's going on? And they can't see it from the system that is creating the problem. So they vote for government to give them more money. Yeah. And they make it worse. And they make it worse. And they make it worse. And, 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 and then they listen to the same people that are incented by that system. Right telling them Bitcoin's bad. Instead of opting out of the system. So, because they so see Bitcoin need... as a risk instead of it's, it's the safest thing you could do right now. Effectively, when, if a government says to you, if any government says, listen, what we're going to do is lock the bank so you can't buy Bitcoin and we're going to stop the on-ramps. They are screaming at you with a loudspeaker to buy Bitcoin as fast as you can. Okay, well, they're not saying that yet. They're not really saying that. But if they, if they do, it, the, it, yeah. no matter where in the world, that's what China did. Yeah. Right? That's they're that. screaming. And then you have a social credit system that the government controls everything. Every I, way of life. You, you were actually very ahead of the game in forecasting a CBDC. <laughs> yes. In, I, what was it in? How, how many years ago did you forecast? 2019. Yeah, that you said that we would this have is what a look programmable like. fiat currency linked to a system where we monitor behaviors. Yeah, you called that in 2019. Yeah. I'm going to digress very quickly to that point. Do you see that happening? You, you, you called out the possibility. You said it was very likely. We are seeing it play out exactly as you called it back then. But do you, 
I, how do I you see, see it as a probability, a high probability in different countries. Will it work long term? Will people fall for it? Yes, because you'll give people program money and you say, here's $100 out, uh, out of UBI. There you go. And you'll lock them into that system. And, and a lot of people will think that they're safe yeah. when they've just given away every individual right and freedom. By, by, by moving into that. Distributed through welfare, through in, universal basic income. Exactly. And incentives matter. And, and so if you have incentives that accrete power for to more wealthy and powerful that take power from everybody else and, and that incentive, and you can gamify that incentives, people will do, the, they'll take the short-term action instead of the, the right action because they don't see it from the system. And again, that's why Bitcoin's so... Now, so will it be tried? Yes. But if you imagine... Every country with a CBDC, how could they trade together? Because they would have to each understand, how could there be global trade? Because then you'd have to manipulate every currency transition, the, the market rates between, uh, be, between um, uh, currencies. And so, and, and this is all in parallel while Bitcoin is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So they will fail. And I'll tell you another reason why they, they'll, they'll fail. And I'll use a personal example. When the, when, when the iPhone came out um, and, uh, in BlackBerry, even though I'm pretty good at predicting the future, um, on, on Black, I couldn't predict my own actions. I told everybody I would use my BlackBerry forever. I loved the buttons. I was one of those too. Exactly. Remember it? Oh, <laughs> I like it's, so, the it's so great. It's so great. And BlackBerry is a massive company. It was the top in the industry and everything else. And when an iPhone was put in my hands, I changed instantly. So if I try to, if I back up what happened there, so the iPhone was being developed for three years before 2007. Now we take it for granted that it was always there. So three years before 2007, it was in development. It was an idea in somebody's head um, that said, I'm going to create something totally different than the market that the market doesn't know they need. And then I'm going to put it into market and the market's going to change. And so that was just an idea of creating the future that existed in Steve Jobs' head that then then created a whole new paradigm that we use, and I changed in an instant. So if you concentrate all power up to a central authority, how could that central authority predict what every single human would want to do in every single thing when they can't see it? Right? We can't see what will change until something's been delivered by an entrepreneur that we never even knew we needed. And so how could any central authority, if you centralized everything in the CBDC and they told you what you want, what would life look like? You have to, living standards must go down. Right. It, must look like, it must look like Soviet Union. It must look like that. And, and while we look at for a time in China and we think it works, people are measuring a very short time frame and it doesn't work. Well, the thinking there is that people would choose it as opposed to have it imposed on them. I mean, there are various sort of nightmare scenarios that people have discussed where people are forced into a CBDC and it's not so much their choice. And I'm not even talking about a CBDC now. I'm talking about the result of a CBDC means that there is no free market. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So there is no entrepreneur that would say, I'm going to create something that can't be seen because of the economic value to do that. You just live and get the free money. And that means, that means living standards must decline. Uh, certainly no positive outcomes. Well, the from central a CD, bank, some, digital, from a, yes, from a digital a, currency, which is a reminder to our viewers, is a form of digital fiat that a central bank would issue that allows governments to monitor every single transaction and potentially program the currency to work or not work as they see fit. We toss around the acronym CBDC, but it still surprises me. Uh, that many people are still not really aware of it. So I always like to just it's reinforce really, that really point. really good idea. Um, you, you did say, though, just still on the CBDC, that you thought the problem could be other central banks using the CBDC amongst each other, the interoperability issue. Aren't they working on that? Aren't they currently um, experiments? What it's about Project Icebreaker, I believe, the Central Bank of Israel That's and cool. Norway working on the interoperability challenges. So, so the digital one. You just, do people actually think that's going to be a global reserve currency? Perhaps. So who's going to trust the digital one and somebody in China could press a keystroke and liquidate everybody who's holding it? And, and if you carry that forward, so will they try? Will every nation try to make that because of the power generated by, by it? Yes, they'll try. 
what about a central bank digital currency backed by a basket of commodities, which is what the speculation is that the BRICS countries could be working on? So those, um, and, and, and what, so all of these will be tried. Um, okay. and, and all, all of these will be tried. But if you, if you think about how this system works today, even the U.S. system, the U U.S. needs labor to be cheaper relative to the world to be able to onshore more manufacturing, more production. Mm -hmm. um, and while China pegs its, its do dollar to the U.S. dollar um, and, and essentially uses that structure, then their labor is cheaper. All of the manufacturing moves there. And you can't break that. And so if you keep printing money, you make China stronger and stronger and stronger by that. And China then does the same thing to Africa through Belt and Road. And you create your trade. And so this game is being played all over the world. And then what ends up happening is when you, when we talk about Venezuela or Argentina, when, when, when they've gone through massive hyperinflation, what's happened is they've been rug pulled. All their savings are gone. So yeah. you could work your entire life, your savings are gone and you've been rug pulled. But what ends up happening from relative to the world is now your labor and materials are way cheaper. Yeah. And money rushes in again to be able to rug pull again. And so that's, a, that's an artifact of having a reserve currency that can't solve the Triffin dilemma. The world needs a global neutral currency. Right. It, it, and and we, we've never seen something that could act as a global cur uh, neutral currency because they always have manipulation. There's so much power in controlling money. Then, then human nature throughout time has always manipulated money. And that's why gold keeps on getting manipulated and gets centralized and then it gets manipulated. Um, we go to war to resolve that and it goes back and forth. And so we've never had a neutral reserve money um, uh, globally. And that's what Bitcoin offers. It's a neutral reserve, uh, uh, it's, not, it's a neutral money, it's a neutral bearer instrument, but it's in a technology that on layer two, you have unlimited velocity in money. Wanted discuss the whole layer layer two okay. issue uh, in, in greater detail, but <clears throat> you said that when you were looking at this, you were looking at the various risks of what could break Bitcoin, that what could possibly derail your thesis here. What were some of those risks? And, and you said you came to a 0 0.1 yeah. probability. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were some of those risks? So so when you first, and, and, and it, it, Again, Bitcoin is like a prism. As you start to to look at it, then you go deeper and deeper on all its various attributes. And and if it was a new discovery that was outside of manipulation, then just that statement, like if it's a once in a lifetime discovery or invention that can't be manipulated, then that 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 in itself, just saying that, you can't just say that, right? You have to, from a first principles understand why that's the case. You can't take somebody's word for something like that, because if that's wrong, if somebody says that and that's wrong, <laughs> and you go build all your time to it and it fails, then it looks like Solana or Dogcoin or whatever. And, and, and so you're just wasting your time. So I, one of the things I looked at is the blockchain trilemma. And blockchain trilemma is, uh, if you looked at uh, it, can, a blockchain can solve two of three sides of a, uh, of a triangle. And so security, decentralization, or scalability. But you can only choose two. So let's just go through the options. Bitcoin solved decentralization and security. And as a result of solving decentralization and security, and that's provable every year, more hash rate, more decentralization, provable. So nothing I'm saying here isn't evidenced <laughs> by increasing hash rate, what's happening in Bitcoin. But what that meant is it couldn't be scalable. You could only do five to seven transactions on the main chain. So let's just imagine a world. We don't have to imagine. We could look back at the world that happened. And something was a discovery that, that was that powerful and got more and more decentralized and secure each year. That would act like more and more value. It would be going up in price um, for or other prices being measured against it would be going right. down. But it would look to everybody like that's going up in price and making a whole bunch of people rich. And so that very act would say, I'm going to create a better Bitcoin or another Bitcoin. 
So let's go through the different options or value. Uh, so uh, because it's open source technology, every, anybody can, I run a node myself. And so I'm auditing the entire blockchain all the time. Um, and so anybody can do that anywhere in the world and they can see what I'm saying is true. Um, then you could create, you could just take the open source code, say I have a better one and do another, uh, do another one. And you could do it tomorrow and Dogecoin is that, right? And so let's use, so now I have a new coin with the exact same utility as, as Bitcoin, but without any of the security, any of the decentralization security. Why would people use it other than gambling, right? Other than a trade for a long time. It has no long-term utility. Let's go through some of the other options. So instead of focusing on decentralization and security, I'll focus on scalability and security. Ethereum. And, and, and so it, it, it's fairly secure. Um, it's scalable, but it, it centralizes. And then you have to ask yourself, what economic value would you use a, a, a centralized blockchain for? Because a blockchain is a high cost database. And would Amazon move their products to a high cost database that somebody else controlled? You'd never do it. No economic calculation would make that work over the long time be, be, besides gambling, right? Um, and even while a lot of people would be getting rich in that process, you, you could see a free market just developing on all of these use cases because Bitcoin could only do <laughs> one thing really well. It couldn't be built on. You couldn't do anything on top of it. But use the other example. I'm gonna sacrifice uh, security. Um, and if I sacrifice security like Solana and it gets hacked all the time, nobody's gonna build their future on that. So, so that's where Bitcoin was for most of Bitcoin. And now just recently, but in, in what ends up happening in, in technology is uh, technology um, uh, ossifies over time it, uh, or, or technology stacks ossify over time in protocols. And so Bitcoin looks more like TCP IP, which was invented by DARPA in, in, in the 1960s. And then the layers that came on top of it. Now, now if TCP IP failed, everything... Break that down for us, TCP IP. TCIP, we're talking te about the internet. Te technology yep. pro protocol. The, the base layer of the technology uh, protocol was invented by DARPA in the 60s. But it wasn't until layer 2, layer 3, layer 4, which it was HTTP. Mm -hmm. That was invented in 1989, hypertexting technology together. Remember, the first layer has to be so secure because if it isn't everything Space, built yeah. on the top off the of it fails yeah. and so so what ends up happening is they ossify they're they're attacked they're attacked they're attacked to does it does it stand up to to attack what you're seeing from the existing financial system all the attacks it's ossifying is getting stronger and stronger and stronger on the base that's bitcoin base layer it's a, it's the new peer-to-peer -peer. so it's, it's going to be the new peer-to-peer -peer internet built on that base. It's so strong because it's decentralized and secure. And if you tried to do scalability on that layer, you would open up attack factors. So the, the, the strength was that it was immovable. When you hear Bitcoin maxis and they're protecting that base and you get mad, well, my coin does better things, you should be thanking them because that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. And, and the hundreds of thousands of nodes all around the world that control that that will not change 21 million cap or any of these rules ossify that base. And then what ends up happening is, and, and there's so much confusion because people are looking through this misinformation that they can't see this as a protocol. And then the next layer of the protocol gets built. In, in lightning or liquid. And there's a whole bunch of different lightning or, or different instances that then every 10 minutes come down to the base protocol. So you don't risk the base and now you get unlimited scalability, a network, um, a payment network on top of a bearer instrument. So now you can move a bearer instrument to anywhere in the world at lightning speed. And then other, uh, other layers are built on top of that. And by the way, that's an incredibly exciting future. We're really early in that process. But, but what it means is how hard it is to understand Bitcoin and some of the things we're talking about right now for people that are measuring their life here. Yeah. It's getting easier and easier and easier. And just like when, remember the internet when and you couldn't download anything? 
and you yeah. couldn't think about watching a movie on, on the internet. All of these use cases. Remember the iPhone came out in 2017 or 2007. That was 17, 18 years after HTTP based on the same technology stack. So what's happening now is all of the use cases, all of the value, all the things that make this easier to interoperate are being built right now. Um, and, and when you're living in, and so they're built, being built on hard money. They're being built on something that is a truthful network. Um, and, and, it, and, and it literally paves the way for abundance for humanity. And it, it's the most exciting time to be in this spot. Yeah. So you're saying that um, as the layer two protocols that we're seeing get developed on a foundation that we've proven to be a strong base and start developing more functionality, that they will make the use case for all of the other altcoins irrelevant and, and obsolete, if I may it, yes. summarize that. that, that's, what, that that's what I believe is happening. It'll, that'll take time too, because people will, but I don't see a use case, I don't see a use case for another coin. But let's take that internet example, yeah. as you said. People use the internet all the time. They have no idea how it works and they don't need to know how it works. I, I don't know how it works to, to any great detail, right? But it doesn't stop everybody from using it around the world of various levels of education. What does it take to get that same level of hyper Bitcoinization in terms of a functionality, a day-to-day -day use that gets everyone to adopt Bitcoin beyond the understanding of it's a challenge to the system, it's a store of value asset, it's a hedge against inflation. Yeah. At what point does it become so easy to use, like we use the internet, that we get to that hyper Bitcoinization and, and how do we get that? So in areas right now where we take for granted money has been stable, then we're closer to the money monopoly. And so we don't see how big a deal this is. But it, and, and so, again, what favors the uh, who's favored by a technological change? The people furthest away from the monopoly. Mm -hmm. So, so people like in El Salvador, people in Africa, you should see the rate of growth of Lightning and, and, and Bitcoin in some of these regions, because now you don't have to go through Visa, you don't have to go through banking, you don't, where where they don't have stable money, and they can trade on on Lightning Network that is a second layer on Bitcoin with a fraction of a penny of a fee, and they can move money instantly anywhere in the world. These, these areas are exploding. So you have a network effect building on Bitcoin, and you have a further network effect building um, as people peer-to-peer -peer trade value all over the world on top, of, on top of it, which is lightning, which is they're growing faster and faster. And people are measuring price when they should be measuring how many people are using it and getting value. And, that, and that's still very, very early. Like if you think, think about where Lightning is today, and where the internet was, HTTP was 89. Lightning, you could call it three years old. I'm just going to stop you there for our viewers that may not be familiar with the Lightning Network and, and how it operates. We've been trying to get Jack Mullers on the show. Hasn't happened yet. He's, okay. fanta he's fantastic. So <laughs> okay. last night, I can help you. <laughs> give us, give us a, a brief summary of the Lightning Network before we, we continue, just for the viewers that aren't that familiar with it. So on, on Bitcoin layer one, you can only do five to seven transactions per second. And the, and the fee, so if you're moving large amounts of money, it will pay, pay a fee for, to, to be in that large chain, then you can move that on lay, layer one. And when I, you can move a billion dollars tomorrow anywhere, and nothing could stop you on, on, on layer one, you can move it anywhere. On, on layer two, it's designed for, you can still move large transactions, but there's a cost in that block space and people compete to move those transactions in that block space. On layer two, um, the, it's, it's a way faster network on top of that, or way faster protocol on top of this. And so it does a trade-off. There is a, a tiny security, right? So a scalability, so, that, so, so it could centralize a little bit more. There's a number of different in, instances, unlike Bitcoin, where it could centralize over time and provide uh, still competition but, but less decentralization than, than layer one. And so it makes trade-offs, but now the trade-off you have, you can do millions of transactions a second on top of Bitcoin now. And that trade, it instantaneously, virtually free, why would a business pay 3% to Visa and charge the customer more when the customer could pay in Bitcoin and for a fraction of a penny? 
And so now what you have is businesses starting to see this and they're saying, wait, I can actually collect money in Bitcoin and get paid more and I can deliver more value to my to, to, to the user to, to be able to do that. We wouldn't see that as much in North America or Europe because we're closer to the money monopoly. But in a whole bunch of regions in the world, and I've been to a whole bunch of these places, it's there's communities that all they're doing, they're, it, they're, Bitcoin is their world. Every trade is in Bitcoin and you're buying fruit and vegetables and everything is in Bitcoin. So it's normal in some places. Two points there. Um, on the transacting in Bitcoin, I know we started off by saying that the price of Bitcoin isn't going up, it's that everything is being priced in Bitcoin. But, but right now, the argument has been, should Bitcoin be seen as a store value or as a currency? Because why would I want to spend my Bitcoin to buy a small item, a cup of coffee, if I'm you know, hoping that it will appreciate to $100,000 and I get we're pricing it in fiat, which is what you're saying. I get that I'm seeing it through the lens of the old system still. But help us understand that if, if you're expecting uh, Bitcoin to appreciate dramatically in the fiat system, why would you be using it as a currency to interact until we shift over fully to the I Bitcoin? Love, I, I love that question because for a while I didn't. And, and what I re realized is I was being kind of a hypocrite. I, was, I have many technology companies, boards of many technology companies. I know I've always done well in technology. And so, but I was, I had a certain allocation to Bitcoin and, and I was talking about this was going to transition the world and 90% of my time was in the fiat world and 10% of my time was in Bitcoin and I had, essentially I had a hedge against the fiat world. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is I'm just going to move my time. I'm going to move 90% of my time into Bitcoin. I'm going to measure the world. I'm going to live in the world that I want to see happen. I'm going to accelerate the progress. That's why we started the Venture Capital Fund to be able to build on top of this uh, network and spend my time with all the builders. But that also involved spending Bitcoin wherever I could because I was giving an advantage to all the businesses that were accepting it and I was making it happen faster. And as I made it happen faster, just how much abundance, how much more opportunity there is. And I can, I can buy more Bitcoin. Right now I can buy more Bitcoin. Later on, the only way you're going to get more Bitcoin is you're going to have to deliver value to somebody else in their terms. So we're investing in businesses that are acquiring more Bitcoin by providing value to people to be able to build the rails of this, uh, of this technology. And, and so I just, so I realized I wanted to shift my time into the world I wanted to see instead of yelling at the world I was seeing. But that's you yeah. and you have the luxury of doing that. You potentially have the economic freedom both in the fiat world and in the Bitcoin world to do that. My question is how do we shift people to use Bitcoin as a currency when they're still in the fiat world and do not have the freedom to say, I'm going to really focus all my energy in making this happen because they still are concerned about the financial implications of the fiat world while they're still in it. So they're, they're keeping their Bitcoin as a store of value and not using it as a currency, which you're saying is necessary to shift us it's into not, the new paradigm. It's not necessary. It just makes it happen faster, no matter what this is going to happen. But this makes it faster. And then you and so so and measure every single person on this planet has the same opportunity that I do. Exact same. Right now, you could have a 170 IQ person in Africa that is now competing on this network with you um, and and and. and and, cre and creating value for other people and expanding this network. And the, and the earlier that you move to, uh, to, the net, uh, to the network, and the more that you're doing, you're meeting all of these entrepreneurs that are building the future. So if you were the first employer, second employer, 10th employee, or 100th at Apple or Google, your life would probably look pretty good. That opportunity is right now on top of the, so there's all of these skill, many of the skill sets that were needed in the existing world are similarly needed in Bitcoin and all these technology that are building, essentially solving problems to provide more value to people. And if you solve that problem, essentially if you're providing more value to people, so it, Bitcoin, let's say, is easier to integrate with. 10 years ago, Bitcoin was really hard. Mm -hmm. um, now it's getting easier. That's been solved by different companies and 
as they solve it, they accrue value. And, and anybody could just move over and start to spend more time and start to meet more people that are doing this. And as they do, what they will do is they'll move out of a system that it literally has to get worse and worse and worse and will conspire and it'll corrupt, it'll take their time. It'll, it, it, they're, they're so scared and they're gonna get, feed, and they can just move into a system of hope. When they move into a system of hope, they'll see what we see at this conference. You see beautiful, loving, really smart people that are building the future. And it's just a really exciting spot to be. I think it's a good segue for you to expand on the idea that money is information with what you said there, because that when you sort of see it in that light, that money is not really about the fact that I have a certain number of digital units in my bank account or a certain amount, amount of pieces of, of cash in my wallet, pieces of paper. It's, it's that the information that I know that I can um, purchase certain things with it or the feeling of security that I get when I look at my, my bank account and, and see the numbers there. H help me explain this idea that you do so very well that money is information. Elaborate on that. Yeah, so in a, in a, I wrote that in, a, in an article called Finding Signal in a Noisy World that explained what was happening in, in terms that ho I was hoping people could understand it. And money, and, and, and we don't think about that very often. It's just a ledger system, and it's, it's information. And then in information, we actually don't want more money. We think we want more money. What we want is the carrying capacity of that money. We look at our lives and we say, here's the things we want. And money is an abstract concept for those things. And so we compare our lives. Here's, here's what I have. Here's what I think I need to be able to get that, that thing. And money is just the information describing what you want. Some people describe that they want more money because the truth is they want more, they want more recognition that they matter. Right? And some people want more uh, money because they can leave legacy to their kids so they matter. Some people want more money so they can take more vacations or have a nice car. But it always describes the feeling that, you're, 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 um, uh, that you want. So if money was information, which it is, and you had manipulation of money, which there is, and that manipulation of money had to grow exponentially, to be able to solve what we were talking about before, then, then everyone on the planet, and you could argue me too, would be looking through misinformation. So it's only information, you apply manipulation, um, and you that means everyone has to be looking through misinformation. And But they think they have perfect information. And their friend, who they can't believe their friend can't see the thing that they see perfectly. And, and everybody thinks that because they're all looking through that misinformation that's exploding because all money is is information. So if you allow some, who gets to destroy your ledger? Who, why would you want an, a dishonest ledger running your life? What would happen in that world? And what you see is all over the world, um, all of these things that we feed and get, make stronger and stronger are as a result of a dishonest ledger and money is just information. And so, so when, you, when you see that, then you, then you think, I'm gonna to build to an honest ledger. I'm gonna to build to an honest ledger that nobody can control, that is for all of us. And, uh, and, and, that, and, and why it's so clearing once you get there, is you, you realize that I don't have to worry about what's happening. I have empathy for everybody in that system. But in my life, prices are falling every year in my life and in the, in the because my denominator is fixed and everything and, and i'm seeing tons of opportunity more and more opportunity all the time just on the issue of the denominators fixed just to push back that the denominator is not fixed at the moment i mean the denominator is quite volatile i'm talking about and uh, but the denominator is fixed at 21 million oh right? that denominator is fixed not the denominator in terms of how we see Bitcoin back priced in the old system. Because you're pricing, and remember the other thing that, that when we're talking about this, remember everything's with a lag. Do you remember when, uh, when there'd be, so there's about an 18 month lag by the time Fed does something or yeah. another central bank does something and it hits the economy. So remember when everybody was saying there'd be no inflation, right? 
Well, and not everybody was saying but, Powell. Powell was trying to convince but us that inflation people, was transitory. A lot of people, every economist, no, no, that was transitory. First, there'd be no inflation. The last thing we need to worry about is inflation. Then inflation, then or maybe a little, then it's transitory. And now we have inflation, and so that's just because of the lag effect mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that is happening. And that same lag effect in in Bitcoin, because there's because the it, because it's one thousand times smaller than right. the existing system, it's still dealing with that lag effect and what's happening o o over here. But if you just measure that on a long enough time horizon, it's repricing the entire system. What would that time horizon be? It, that's uh, that, that's hard to say because because there's so many different variables. Country country each country is going to take their own action. I could see I could see a short term, not even a short term. I could see within three to five years, some some uh, government say, we're going to pay you to Bitcoin and try to create another fiat currency regime on top of it, like mm -hmm. a, from a, but if you just, again, go back to first principles about technology, what that would mean is, is you could reset the debt onto something, uh, something new, everybody would be rug pulled. <laughs> is that something new? And it would look good for a while. But if you if you ran a debt based model on top of that, a massive debt based model of mo monetary system that requiring inflation and credit based system on top of that, then it would then the inflation rate would have to tick up faster because technology is moving faster. The natural natural thing should be prices are falling and any government trying to stop that from happening is essentially a centralizing function at a faster and faster rate. And because they have so much to lose, they will try and stop it at, at various points. There will be resistance. And I know I'm asking you to really speculate here, but this paradigm shift where everybody sees the world as you do and everybody interacts with the world as you think they should on the Bitcoin standard, and there is hyper Bitcoinization. How many generations away is that? What would be a rough estimate? Oh, I, again, you can't predict something like this on timing, but it, but it could actually happen faster than uh, than it, like it could. It, this isn't my expectation, but it, it could happen within ten or fifteen years. Um, because and why it could happen at that rate is because more and more people, as more and more people see it they're going to bring more and more uh, others and more and more, and it's going to accelerate. And that network effect that gives more and more value mm -hmm. is going to explode and more and more people are going to see it. And there is no choice but the existing system to, to essentially, it has to deceive. It's based on theft, everything. I, so it has to continue to lie. So one makes the other stronger. And then as more and more people move to it, more and, and the rails get easier and easier to use, and more and more value is delivered. It can uh, it it, uh, it can it can move faster. I expect it to be. Uh, I, I'm not inside that. Inside that, there's going to be lots of Bitcoin's dead. This is going to happen. CBDC. Yeah. All of these things. All of these. I just I've tuned out of the movie that I know that's going to happen on both sides, and I'm just lit. And I'm spending as much time tuning that out and realizing this is where I'm going to spend my time. But you don't think it's impossible that we get to the movie that you're watching, to put it in your metaphor, within 15 years? Not impossible. Wow. But, 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 and and what, what I see with many of my friends and in this, uh, in this, and that's why I'm so hopeful, is they're already living in that future. It's just not, it's not widely distributed yet. But you could live in that future right now. You don't have to wait. And that's part of what this conference is about, living in that future. A final thought, Jeff, what has been your main takeaway from Bitcoin 2023? Just, I, I, I'm, I, I would say I'm filled with love. The, when, you, when, when you walk around and you see some of the people and people whose lives you changed and, uh, and, and, and just all of the hope yeah, in this, this is a, I, nobody was looking at the price. The builders are building. And they're really excited about building the future. Well, we have loved having you here with us on Kidco News. And we hope to have you back on to carry on teaching us about love, hope and Bitcoin and a new economic and monetary system and paradigm. So thank you so much, Jeff Booth. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, thank Michelle. you. And as always, thank you for watching Kitco. I'm Michelle McCory. We'll see you soon. Kitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy.